I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction about what accessibility is, um, why it matters, and also give you a bit of an overview of some of the interesting things that have been happening in accessibility recently. So it's been an exciting time. So starting from the start, what actually is accessibility? Well, when I talk about accessibility, I'm referring specifically to disability. So I'm going to start off with an explanation of what disability itself actually is. And for that, I have this chap here to help me. So this was a photo that was taken from an investigation that he was doing for a newspaper in the UK. And I'm sure looking at this picture, most of the people in this room would be able to have some kind of a guess about what it is that's making this guy disabled. So you might be guessing, perhaps, that he has cerebral palsy. In which case, you'd be correct that he has cerebral palsy. However, cerebral palsy is not actually a disability. It's a medical condition, and that's a really important distinction to make. So what else? You might be thinking about the fact that he's in a wheelchair. But again, obviously he's in a wheelchair, but that is not a disability either. It's like a pair of glasses. It's assistive technology that's actually helping him go about his day. And he was going about his day just fine until he went to meet his friends in this bar and encounter the steps. So in the context of meeting his friends in this bar, it's the steps that are disabling him. And that's what disability is. It's when someone's medical condition encounters some kind of a barrier resulting in difficulty performing a day-to-day -day task. And these barriers, whether it's a flight of stairs or a shelf that's too high or red and green colors in a death match, they're often put there by another person. That's the result of a design decision which is a bit of a heavy thing to get your head around that as designers, as developers, as researchers, we are actually contributing to people's disability. But there is the flip side of it as well, which is that by being aware of the kind of barriers that people can encounter, we can identify barriers that are avoidable and unnecessary and remove them. And it's that process that's known as accessibility. And accessibility is important. It's really important for many, many reasons, but two in particular. One being that people with disabilities are a market, and a significant market as well. The latest data, official uh, USA government data, is 22% of the adult population. Now, not everyone within that 22% is going to be someone who comes up against barriers and games. But on the other hand, there's a whole bunch of other conditions on top of that 22%. Color blindness, 8% of males. Difficulty reading, 14% of adults. That's one you never hear about because of the stigma attached to it. On top of that, you have temporary impairments, like a broken arm. Situational impairments, like trying to play when there's sunlight on your screen. So whichever way you look at it, there's many, many, many people who are affected by these kind of barriers, which obviously equates to a market, which equates to money to be made, money to be lost through accessibility. And then the other side is not quite so mercenary. It's just the simple human benefit, the good that games can do. Because what games actually represent is access to culture, to recreation, to socializing. Now, these are things that a lot of people just take for granted. But if for any reason your means of accessing those things in day-to-day -day life is for some reason restricted, then games can then become a really, really powerful contributor to your quality of life. Well, to sum it up much more concisely than I did, this is one of my favorite quotes. So that's what accessibility is and why it matters. And um, next up, why is this relevant to user research? Why is this relevant to user experience? And there's a very, very simple reason for that, which is this. So obviously, everyone in this room knows exactly what that letter stands for. What it doesn't stand for is subset of your users who happen to not have some kind of impairment at the moment. You know, it's our job working in user experience to represent our users, and that includes all of our users. And there's a few different ways that you can do that working in UX, working in UR. Um, one, depending on how your company is set up, if you do insights, that kind of stuff, you can start looking at um, usage data on features. Start identifying when people do put an accessibility feature in, see if it gets usage. If so, that justifies further investment in it next time. 
Also playtesting, recruiting people in playtests. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the intricacies of that. Um, I'm going to leave that for Q&A. And then the last thing is expert review, just becoming familiar with the kind of barriers, the kind of solutions that are involved, and then also advising people in your team on that kind of stuff. So again, I'm not going to go into a list of all the possible things that can be done. If there are any particular features you want to know about, then Q&A. Um, in general, though, have a look at this site. This is gameaccessibilityguidelines.com, and it's got all that kind of information on it. And it's an exciting time, as I said at the moment. Um, every single year, the pace of change accelerates. More and more stuff is done that's really, really nice every year. And going back a year previously, in 2015, the big, big news was, for the first time, game consoles getting a suite of accessibility features. So the Xbox One, PlayStation 4, now have things like text-to-speech, so that people who are blind can navigate the system interface. Also, things like high contrast mode, zoom, being able to configure your controls at a system level. And that's continued on into 2016 as well. So neither company has kind of rested on their laurels, and that's continuing to develop. And it's also now spread out further, apart from the consoles. So this is Steam. Steam also now allow remapping at a platform level. Which is nice, you know, the consoles and, and Steam doing this kind of stuff. Remapping is really valuable if just you've got some kind of motor restriction that means that some areas of what is really a very complicated interface, uh, input device, are more difficult or just impossible to reach. If you can move those commands to somewhere that's more comfortable for you, that can mean the difference between playing and not playing. But what's better than doing it at a system level is doing it at a game level. There's a lot more things that are opened up to you. You can, for example, um, set up, allow people to set up different maps for whether you're driving, whether you're walking. You can also make sure that all your um, tutorial prompts and stuff also reflect people's mappings. But there's a barrier to doing it in games, which is implementation costs. Which Unity are now doing something about. So Unity are currently working on a new input model that's announced in the past year. Which basically abstracts everything, abstracts your actions from your inputs at a system level. It's all done for you. And this includes some really advanced stuff, so um, mapping between different input devices, so you can remap like a mouse click to pushing forward on your forward on an analog stick, mapping between analog and digital both ways. Lots of really, really nice stuff, lots of complicated stuff that is just done for you. All the heavy lifting's done. It's just a case of UI on top of it. And there's been some nice advances recently outside of the dedicated gaming space as well. So what you're looking at here is this is an iPad on the right, and the um, operating system is being controlled solely by that yellow button that the kid is using. And that's what's something that's called an accessibility switch. It's a type of technology that people use when they can't use any kind of traditional input device. And it can take loads of different forms. It could be a infrared blink detector. It could be a tube that you blow into. Basically, anything that allows you to have a simple on-off action. Any design interfaces that support that, and that's what iOS has done. So you can actually operate their entire operating system just using one single input. So that often works by just, you know, you have a highlight around an item on the screen, pauses on each item, and it gets the one you want. You make whatever input you can, it selects it. They've got a second mode, which is useful for playing games, where it basically works like uh, shooting in a basketball game. So you have a line going back and forth across the screen, make your input, choose the coordinate. Same the other way. So you choose a specific coordinate on the screen. Then you get the menu pops up asking you what action you want to perform at that point, which then makes interface-based games accessible, like Football Manager, that kind of thing, or work with this type of technology. And what's happened recently is they've actually put in updates specific for games. So once you've chosen the coordinate, in iOS 9, they added the ability to tap repeatedly at that point, meaning games like Cannonbolt, games like Flappy Birds, just work now. And then iOS 10 more recently, they upgraded it again to allow you to hold down the button as well. So that means games like Badlands, games like uh, Jetpack Joyride work. And this is a really, really beautiful example of how operating system accessibility can work. Because through those fairly simple things for them to implement, they've made thousands of games just work with this kind of hardware for the most demanding types of audiences. So platform aside, it's also been a nice time for the games as well. And one very, very interesting advance has been Pokemon Go. 
Not because it was an advance in accessibility. Pokemon Go is a pretty inaccessible game. Part of that's because of the physicality of the game, having to walk up hills and stuff, but a lot of it's actually just due to the interface. So the fact that it relies on lots of complex gestures, it has um, small, low contrast text, not great for a game that's supposed to play outside in the sun. Um, the map screen differentiates items based on color alone. So there's lots of reasons why the game is inaccessible, which obviously that's not in advance. It doesn't make the game unique either. What is unique is the amount of discussion that went on about it. So on um, blog posts, social media, advocacy groups, even got people like um, American Foundation for the Blind and stuff talking about this, like people who don't think about gaming at all normally, which is really interesting to see. I think it's, it's an example of two things. Firstly, that the, the landscape is changing. So people, gamers, um, understanding of accessibility and expectations of accessibility, expectations of what games should be are changing. I think it's also a really nice example of the cultural significance of games, because a lot of this commentary, there's an undertone of people who can see this, this cultural thing going on, on around them and don't want to be excluded from it. They want to be able to take part in this thing that everyone else is talking about. And Pokemon Go aside, the other thing that obviously has dominated the um, both mainstream and games press has been VR over the past year. And VR can be a pretty exclusionary platform. Um, there's all kinds of requirements above and beyond regular gaming. So requirements to be able to walk around a physical space, to be able to um, use two working arms and hands to operate hand tracking um, motion controllers, to be able to rotate your neck, even just a simple act of being able to physically wear a bulky device on your head. Some of those barriers are kind of inherent to the platform, but a lot of them can easily be designed around. And there are a lot of developers who are understanding this, implementing some really nice creative accessibility solutions and talking about it. Which has been really, really nice because that isn't something that we've had before. When motion controls first came around, we didn't see this level of understanding, this level of implementation. When touch screens came around before that, we didn't have this. So this is a really, really encouraging sign. And we've seen progress in individual features. So as you can see, this is some, um, this is just from a uh, single thread on NeoGAF, some of these comments. So this is obviously relating to subtitles. Um, subtitles across the entire industry in all games, including all of your games, are really, really bad. And as you can see, this is, this is coming from the game, is not just from me. But finally, finally, that is starting to change. So this is one example. This is from um, the latest Tomb Raider game. So you can see it's got letterboxing to provide clear contrast between the text and the background. It also uses both color and speaker names to let you know who's speaking. Um, but what's really important about this, something that hasn't been done before, is that you can turn those things on and off. Because some people really, really rely on that to be able to understand it. You've got other people, different use cases, people who just have subtitles turned on that they can check occasionally in case an explosion goes off when they're playing or something, who don't like this kind of stuff. So letting people customize it is really, really key. And standard in other industries as well. You know, open up YouTube, open up Netflix, there's loads of configuration options. Those could easily be brought across into games. Another example, this is from Life is Strange. So that's letting you change the size of the subtitles. And that's a really, really important one. That's by far the biggest complaint about subtitles is they're too small. You need to have 46 pixels at least, if not by default, as an option that people can select for subtitles at 1080p. Also what they got here though, so, so that choice of subtitle size has actually been about half a dozen or so games come out in the last year that actually offer you the ability to customize that. The bottom one, the letterboxing, so this outline, the, sorry, the box behind to increase the contrast, they let you decide the opacity, whether or not you want them turned on or off. Just that simple ability to turn the letterboxing on or off, that's something that would make a lot of gamers happy. There's some real different preferences and different use cases for that. What you're looking at is a list of all the games that have ever implemented this. This is it, one game, and it's such a simple thing to do. So if you want to be at the real pinnacle of innovation in the games industry, let people turn that black box off. That's it. Color blindness. That's the other area that's seen some big advances in the last year, continuing its march on towards being a standard practice to consider it. And obviously there's lots more games that are considering it, but what's been really interesting in the last year is the type of games that are considering it. So this is a game called Hue, which is a, um, you can just about see it, it's a color-based puzzle platformer. 
So he's in the process of choosing orange. If you choose orange, the background changes to orange, and that orange box over there disappears. It can no longer be interacted with. If he chose purple, you wouldn't be able to see these ones. You'd then be able to walk through that, that path there. And this is the kind of game that, you know, if, even it was only like two and a half years ago that if a game implemented any kind of colorblindness consideration, that was big front page news. And even, you know, going back a year ago, this kind of mechanic would just be written off as being, you know, this game is just color based, forget it. But now, there we go. Really nice, simple, elegant solution. Add a couple of symbols on there. Fits nicely with the aesthetic, works for all types of colorblindness. Then the next game I'm going to show you is, um, again, this was just being completely written off before as impossible. But it's a similar kind of thing. It's a color-based um, puzzle game, first person this time. But rather than choosing all these different colors, you have to mix colors to get the one you want. So if you want to color something orange to solve a puzzle, you have to paint it red, then paint it yellow to make orange. So how do you make that color blind accessible? By exactly the same method. So you can see, even if you have no color perception at all, you, you know what the symbol is for yellow, you know what the symbol is for red. The symbol for orange is just the two things combined together. So again, this kind of thing would just be written off as impossible, even you know a year ago. So it's much more interesting things now being, much more demanding things now being considered. Now outside of those, I mean, there's all kinds of other, other really nice efforts in games. Like, there's no way I can run through them all, but I'll just give you a few examples. Like this is uh, Madden 17. It's got a whole suite of accessibility options um, for uh, various types of impaired vision. And there's a talk about that on Thursday in GDC. This is something really nice to see. This was Warlock of Firetop Mountain, which is based on the old Choose Your Own Adventure game books, if that rings a bell. And this is a suite of options which are aimed at difficulty reading, dyslexia, which is something that's really, really rare to see considered. Overwatch, Overwatch is a mixed bag. There's some things it does really badly for accessibility, some things it does really well for accessibility. And one of the things it does really well is remapping. So it's got game level remapping, not just in general, but you can set up specific different maps for each of the different character classes, which is really important given the different play styles they've got. It makes this kind of stuff possible. And Uncharted 4. So this was the big one. There's been so much press about this game. Um, so basically what it is is just a set of options that are aimed at motor accessibility. So things like making sure that giving option to play one-handed Give them the option to swap button mashing for just holding down the button. But what makes it really, really important is not so much the features that were implemented, but the fact that it is uncharted. Because there's a common misconception in accessibility that um, accessibility is going to mean watering down your ideas, you know, making the game less fun for the majority just to serve a small niche. And you only have to spend a few seconds looking at Uncharted 4's sales figures, it's Metacritic, it's critical reception. You can't get a more powerful example of that misconception is just that, a misconception. And that's also important because of the impact it's had on the rest of the industry. So I mentioned the colorblindness. It was those first few games back in 2014, the first AAA games, um, Borderlands 2, SimCity, um, Black Ops 2, I believe. Just those first three games, they got a load of press. All of a sudden, everyone knew about color blindness. It started becoming standard practice. And you're seeing this with Uncharted as well. A lot of other people who hadn't considered accessibility before, hadn't really taken it seriously, are now thinking about it seriously. I even heard it referred to in um, one of the big publishers as the Uncharted effect, the difference it's made to their thinking and accessibility. And it's not by accident. They've gone to some lengths to tell people about what they've done as well. And they're not the only people doing that. This is from an uh, indie game, the um, Legacy of the Elder Star. So this is some screen grabs from their trailer. Well, they've dedicated the whole section of their trailer just to tell people about their accessibility features. Which seems obvious, you know, tell people what you've done, but a lot of people don't. And that's the worst thing that could possibly happen is you devote time and energy to doing this stuff only for people not to find it. And there's been a lot of that over the past year. So not just, you know, big fancy videos. This is something I've never seen before until this year. This is from Final Fantasy 15. They actually have a section of their printed manual which has accessibility information in it. And even simpler again, this is from uh, the press release for Hue, which is the um, platform game I was talking earlier. 
they just put this single bullet point in the feature list in their press release. And um, as a result, they had is somewhere in the region of 20 different outlets covering the colorblind mode, um, which, according to the developers, had a direct impact on their Metacritic scores, the positive reception that their work had. But dialogue is a two-way process. It's not just about the information you give to gamers. It's about the information you get back from gamers as well. And this is um, an account that was set up by a Twitter account and an email account to receive feedback on accessibility across all the VA games, which is a really, really important thing. That's a huge roadblock that gamers come up against, just not knowing who to talk to about this kind of stuff when they face a barrier. So this would be something that would be really, really nice to see other studios, other publishers taking up. And we've seen a fair bit of this in the past year as well. People actively soliciting accessibility feedback from the community. So this one's from Indie called Fail Better Games. This one is from uh, Cliff Blazinski, Verboski. And this is actually following on from um, an experience that Cliff had earlier in the year that he posted about. And Cliff um, is not the only high-profile figure who's been voicing their understanding of their recognition of the importance of, its, of accessibility in the past year. So back at E3, Microsoft announced their Gaming for Everyone initiative, which is a general inclusivity initiative, but specifically includes accessibility for gamers with disabilities. So this is a quote from him about that. So to have someone at this level of the industry giving this kind of backing for accessibility is just something that hasn't happened before. And I've got another little quote from him as well. So to put this in context, this is the head of Xbox publicly praising a PlayStation exclusive. That doesn't happen every day. And PlayStation. So this kind of stuff, this is so, so important. Because so many times over the years I've spoken to people, you know, individual developers on the ground who are really, really keen to do some good accessibility stuff, but they just can't, can't get it past their bosses. Their bosses just say, right, forget it. We don't believe in the ROI for this. It's not making it on the backlog, all that kind of stuff. But you need it. You need, if you're going to have lasting cultural change, the pressure has to come from different directions. You have to have the people on the ground who understand what needs to be done and want to do it. You also have to have pressure from the top, from management who are actually willing to empower their staff to make those changes. And you also need to have pressure from outside, from the public, from gamers telling industry that yes, this is actually something we want to happen. And now, for the first time, really we're getting those three pieces starting to fall into place, which means we've got an opportunity like never before to make a real change and make a difference in the industry. We just have to take it. And that's it. So the next part of the session is going to be Q&A. So I hope you've come armed with loads of nice questions to try and stump us. Um, but for this, I've got uh, Laura and White from Microsoft going to come and join me. Right, so we're going to... Is this... It's working. Amazing. Right. So we're going to be this one, and we've got this one to pass around for questions. Long enough to do this, there we go. Right, so I don't know if there's been anything from that from that talk that set off any ideas, um, anything that you want to know about, any individual accessibility considerations, any audiences and that you want to know more about, any of the practicalities of doing user research with these audiences, and you like recruiting, um, the techniques of facilitating, all that kind of stuff. Anything at all, fair game, or any topic at all, you know. Hey, uh, I was just wondering if you have any like guidelines or rules of thumb we can use when we're doing mobile games in particular uh, to help make them more accessible to people. Mobile games in particular, yeah. So a lot of the general stuff applies. Um, there are some things that apply to it to other platforms as well that are particularly important on mobile. 
So things like uh, contrast, if you're dealing with people who are on like small screens, playing in power saving mode, playing in direct sunlight. Um, where it really starts to get unique though is the input, which it comes basically down to, um, well, with accessibility in general, there's only really two principles that everything comes down to. It comes down to either communicating information in more than one way, or it comes down to offering people some flexibility. And with the controls, it's all about the flexibility. So offering people a choice between um, choice between um, motion, like gyroscope, and traditional controls. Offering people some flexibility with virtual controls over the size, over the position. It's also about avoiding unnecessary complexity as well. You know, because like if your game really does require like five fingers on the screen at all times making multi touch gestures, you know that's okay. But there's a good chance it doesn't. So just think carefully about whether you're making controls unnecessarily complicated. Um, and there's actually there's a, a really nice um, example actually of a game called Into the Dead. Is anyone familiar with Into the Dead? No, no one. You should play it. It's basically it's an endless runner, a first person endless runner running into the screen through a field of zombies who are trying to eat you and trying to dodge your way in between them. And um, through the development of that, um, the designers were going for um, tilt controls using the gyroscope, tilting the tablet from side to side to dodge in between these field of zombies. You know, so they thought about the control schemes and stuff, but you know, they're, they're the designers, they understand what fun is, so they're going for that. And eventually, it was actually their um, uh, user research. Does anyone know Hadley Bellum from Pickpock? No, okay, well, it's their user research anyway. Um, he persuaded them right at the 11th hour to include some different options in there for people who can't physically tilt the tablet. You know, they might have someone who's playing with it in a fixed mount, someone who has to play on the lap, all that kind of stuff. So they implemented a uh, left-handed virtual stick. They implemented a right-handed virtual stick. They also implemented like a left and right button on each side of the screen, those four options. But obviously, as I said, the rest of the team, you know, they knew what, you knew, they knew which option was fun. They knew that it was gonna be, everyone's gonna use the tilt. And you know, this is an altruistic gesture, basically, that a few people who can't play will now be able to play. Um, but then they looked at the data, they actually tracked usage data on those four different control schemes. And it was pretty much bang on 25% for each individual one of them. So what they thought was this altruistic gesture had actually resulted in a better game for 75% of their players who preferred not to use tilt. But yeah, good question. So yeah, can you go into the recruiting and the facilitating aspects of accessibility? Yeah, um, what do you mean by facilitating before I start jumping into the recruiting um, part? Well, he mentioned facilitating. Um, I, I guess the, the studies when you're bringing people in, okay. um, are there any considerations we need to make oh, sure you, that we like do? As far as like moderating and interacting? Yeah. With, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so as far as recruiting, um, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people ask me um, how best to reach these audiences. Um, I think one thing to be pretty sensitive about is that a lot of people don't want to kind of admit or like come out um, that they have some type of disability. Um, so that's just kind of one consideration to be kind of sensitive to that and not be, you know, thinking about like having a survey or something like, do you have a disability? Yes or no. Um, you know, that's not the right way to go about that kind of stuff to find people. Um, so I would suggest doing a little bit more kind of public outreach to communities um, and if you were in my talk earlier this morning, um, you know, reaching out to individual communities like the um, blind gamers or blind gamers, uh, that would be awesome. Um, the uh, Association for the Blind, um, different deaf communities in different areas, like wherever you are, um, I guarantee you that there is a community of people um, that are very willing and ecstatic and um, want to provide this kind of feedback to you. It's basically more about you reaching out to them rather than putting the onus on them to reach out to you. Um, so that that's probably the easiest way I can answer that question around recruiting is to um, try to go find them um, rather than you them finding you. Um, as far as moderating, this can get um, a little creative and logistically um, messy sometimes. Um, there are a variety of people, and there are a variety of requirements that um, people are okay with and other people are not okay with. So um, for example, um, someone that is deaf um, may, may use a hearing aid, they may not use a hearing aid. Um, they may know sign language, they may not know sign language. 
Um, they may be able to lip read, they may not be able to lip read. Um, so if you kind of go with this kind of shotgun approach of, oh, well, we're gonna try to recruit gamers with deafness. Um, we'll just make sure that we have an ASL interpreter um, or whatever um, language um, you'd be using primarily. Um, that could be somewhat offensive um, to some deaf folks. Um, so it's best to, you know, in that recruiting process, have that as an inclusion question um, of, you know, would you require any type of, you know, special assistance as far as um, input methods or would you like a translator available, um, that kind of stuff. So it's always better to just ask um, than assume for those kinds of things. Um, and I guess the same kind of thing um, would apply to um, folks that have vision issues as well. Um, so, you know, if you're in a situation where it's not okay to have dogs, like if someone has a guide dog, um, it's those kinds of things. So just thinking of the details of, um, you know, making sure that is your building accessible? Like, <laughs> are there stairs to get to your office? Um, is there a ramp? Is there an elevator? That kind of stuff. So um, it's really just about kind of thinking through the process of what would this person be going through if they were coming um, to a session or if we were going to them for a session or whatever it is. Um, so just kind of thinking about it. So it it is a, um, there are a lot of things to consider, um, but I would just say the easiest thing is always just ask um, people what they're comfortable with. Um, it's better to do that, just assume. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely that just have the conversation instead of assuming. I mean, you often get people who just don't have the conversation because they're worried about offending someone. But someone's going to be a lot less offended if you just ask them rather than they turn up and something's not appropriate for them. Hey, this is great. And I love that you kicked it off with the guidelines as a resource, which I think is fantastic. Is there any resource for keeping track of some of these other examples you've been showing? Like, I think it's very powerful to show someone on the team that Uncharted is doing it, or I've already forgotten the game that was letting you change the box behind it. Is there anybody kind of keeping track, or is there a Reddit thread that we could point people to to say, here are these 15 examples? I mean, th those are always the things that really resonate, but are just almost impossible to keep track of if you're not going through people's UIs on a weekly basis. Yes, the um, the guideline site itself, um, the majority of the guidelines on there have examples of best practices, so screenshots and descriptions and stuff for games that are already doing it. Um, but are those, do those things get updated, like would an Uncharted example yeah, from yeah. this year show up? Oh, yeah. great. They do. Well, there's, there's a big backlog of stuff waiting to go on there, but yeah, they do get updated, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, up to, up, they, well, they need to be updated. You know, it's this fast-moving field, so not just updating with up-to-date examples, but also like new technologies coming along, VR, all that kind of stuff, which is an interesting topic in itself. I'm having a little bit of a brain fart, but I know that there is a site that basically does like an accessibility grade for new games that come out. Um, do you know? Okay, yeah. So I know that there there are a couple of like review sites that go through like, is this game? Does this game support colorblind? Yes or no? Um, does it have subtitles? Yes or no? So it goes through like a laundry list of that kind of stuff. And I, I'm completely spacing on one of the few, but. Yeah, yeah, there's a few. So um, the uh, Josh, he's outside, he's got the booth. Um, he runs one um, called Dagus. Um, there's another one called um, Unstoppable Gamer. Um, Gameaccessibility.com, they do reviews. Um, also a really, really good site for um, iOS um, accessibility is, um, actually there's two. Actually, the first one, sorry, I'm going off some tangents here, but um, one called audiogames.net. They have a really, really active community on there, and the blind, commu blind gaming community is amazing to work with. Really, really cool bunch. So, yeah, that's a really good resource for finding people, going back to the other other topic. But um, what's it called? AppleViz. That's it. AppleViz do um, uh, blind accessibility reviews of iOS games. And there's loads. That I think there's about 400 odd blind accessible games. Um, it's not. It's not that open to developers at the moment because basically blind accessibility on mobile devices works. It, it works really nicely because of the touch screen, which you know you might not necessarily think is something that works well for people who are blind, but basically you switch a mode on it where you can um, basically you run your finger over the screen and it speaks out the text label of whatever element your finger is over. So you can basically use your finger like an eye and see the layout of the screen. It's really nice. Um, but it's rely on native um, development at the moment because the engine engines don't currently output interface elements. They output a bunch of pixels. Um, hopefully that will change at some point in the future, at which point you know it would be amazing, amazing revolution in blind gaming if something like Unity was to support this kind of stuff. But it's a really, really cool tech anyway. And it's built in Android, iOS, Windows phones. You can turn it and have a play. It's really, really nice. 
Sorry, lots of tangents there, but I hope that's useful. Um, so I just want to make sure because not everyone and anyone watching our video later isn't going to get a chance to see this. Um, Joshua Straub from Daggers, that's D-A-G-E-R-S, set up a, a thing outside. Um, and I got a chance to play Uncharted 4 uh, where he's got like a, a basically some goggles you put on that represents fairly minor glaucoma. Um, and he turned on all the accessibility, or he had me play without the accessibility features, and it was impossible. Like, I, I couldn't do it. Um, he turned on all the accessibility features, and one of the key ones was it basically, like, locked onto enemies. Um, and what struck me the most as a really hardcore gamer was that it didn't dumb the game down. I was still playing a challenging game. I, as a, a normal gamer, or as a fully able gamer, was still finding it challenging and interesting. Um, and I was just like, wow, like, this, this actually lets people play Uncharted. Like, they're not playing some super toned-down version of the game. They're still playing the game. Um, it just it blew my mind. Like, I've never seen that in a AAA-level game. Yeah, and, that, and that's, like, the thing, that's the key point. That is, it's, it's not about watering things down. It's just about removing those barriers that are unnecessary. You yeah. know? Do you have any other, like, really good examples of that just offhand? We're just about out of time, so... Of what? what those, those kind of, um, like, simulations and stuff, do you mean? Um, yeah, just, like, the kind of... I don't, I, I know so little that I'm having a hard time articulating the question, but just the kind of games where like they've got these accessibility features that are really powerful that I might take for granted as an able gamer, um, but that just make that so much better for a, a large portion of, of not necessarily just disabled gamers, but folks with any kind of temporary difficulty as well. Yeah, to be honest, it's most accessibility features. Because what you're talking about is is just removing barriers. It's not talking about developing niche stuff. It's seeing finding something that's causing a problem with someone and removing it. It's it's quite unlikely that that's going to be a problem really specific to that group that affects no one else. So so um, like for example, uh, color blindness, classic example. Uh, I don't know if anyone's played Burnout Paradise. Yeah. yeah. So Burnout Paradise. Do you remember the map on it? The map on it is based on colored circles, which is obviously no good if you're color blind. So it's like a red circle for one event, a purple circle for another, that kind of thing. So the solution is to add some icons onto those circles. That's it. It works for everyone who's colorblind then. It also works for all the people who just haven't played it for a week and come back and have to look up the key to try and find out what the purple circle equates to, right? And you often find that out for a lot of accessibility considerations. And like remapping, button remapping, classic example. That's the difference between playing and not playing for a lot of people with impaired motor ability. But also, everyone who just disagrees with the stupid decisions that were made about the default controls, you know? I'm just going to answer um, one little part. So you just mentioned, um, if you can think of any other examples, um, I would say just from a general perspective with games, um, you know, having both a visual and an auditory component is something that I think a lot of us probably take for granted. Um, you know, if you can imagine playing a first-person shooter and you don't hear bullet fire, would you still be able to know that you're actually firing a gun? Um, probably you would be able to because you'd see like some red flame burst uh, from the gun that's right in front of you. So I would think you know that's kind of um, probably a little bit higher level of what you're probably originally asking, but that's just one other example of, well, if sound or vid visuals were gone, the game would be probably completely different but because you have those two things it just gives a better experience yeah, so yeah. Like, the, like the um like if you're playing something like gears of war where if you're being shot from the side you get a little indicator on the screen showing you which direction it's coming from that's something that's a really useful reinforcement for all players but again for someone who actually can't hear the gunfire coming from the side through the stereo speakers that's the difference between being alive and dead so i think are we are we've got time for one more we're up Okay. Oh, sorry. Everyone's coming for the next talk already. All right. Thank you.